All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another lecture. So this week's topic is uh, circular geometry. So basically, uh, properties of circles and any like geometry problem involving primarily circles. So similar to previous weeks, we'll be covering uh, some of the basic principles of circular geometry first. So this will include tangents and sectors, as well as some more advanced topics, such as powers of a point. So we'll go over these topics first, and then towards the end, we'll be doing some problems, and the problems will progressively get more challenging until like the final few problems, which are probably the hardest problems that we'll be doing in these lectures. So we won't be able to be covering many of the proofs to like PowerPoint and these things, However, these things can be found online if you want. However, I think uh, at the middle school level, the, prime, the main purpose of knowing this is for problem solving rather than for a rigorous like knowledge. So uh, our handout is on our website like always. So uh, feel free to look at that if you don't have it and we'll be getting started. So our first topic is arcs and sectors. Okay, so the two main aspects of the circle in general are the perimeter and area. And a lot of problems focus on portions of these. So if you have an arbitrary circle, a portion of the circumference is called the arc. This length is called an arc. And similarly, a portion of its area, which would be something like this, is called a sector. So each of these are defined by the central angle, which they cover. Where the central angle is the angle formed by connecting the endpoints, the center of the and the center of the circle. So the formulas for these two are just ratios of the, of the total. So, if, for example, if we're looking at the um, length of an arc, we know that the total circumference of a circle is two pi r, and we know that an arc covers an angle theta instead of the full angle. And if you read the handout already, you'll know that there are two ways we can measure angles. We can either call them in terms of radians, in which a full rotation is two pi radians, or we can call it in degrees, where a full rotation is 360 degrees. So as we know that the length would just be a, ratio, a proportion of the total circumference, if our angle is theta in radians, the arc length would be theta divided by two pi times two pi r, which is just r theta. And similarly for degrees, it would be two pi r times theta divided by 360 degrees, which equals pi r theta divided by 180. And finding the area of a sector works in pretty much the same way. We know that the total area of the circle is pi r squared. So if we take a fraction theta over 2 pi of that, we get the area of a sector is 1 half theta r squared. And similarly, if we did that for degree, degrees, we get theta over 360, which gives you an area of well, this can't really be simplified much more. So this would be the area in degrees. So now we'll go into a couple of example problems about areas and perimeters involving circles. So here we have a pretty famous problem. This is one of the standard uh, circle geometry problems. So this is called the goblet problem. And so the first part of this problem is that we want to find the perimeter of the shaded region. Well. If we look at the shaded region, what we have are first a semicircle on the top and then this weird bottom shape. So we can see that the semicircle consists of the diameter of the semicircle, which is two since it's the diameter of a circle with a radius one. So this is two. And then that means that the bottom of the goblet is also two since uh, it's basically the same length. So uh, then we have these curves that we want to find the perimeter of. So we can see that each of these curves is exactly one quarter of a full circle. So it's an arc with a measure of uh, 90 degrees. So if we put them all together, we basically just get the circumference of an entire circle with radius one, since we have four of these arcs and each arc is 90 degrees. So the circumference of a circle with radius one is just two pi r. So since the radius is one, we get that the circumference is two pi. So if we add together the 
uh, lengths of the base and the top, we get that uh, in total we have the perimeter being q pi plus four, which is our answer. So the next part of this question is to find the area. So this is a bit more tricky. Well, we can obviously find the area of the semicircle because that's just half a circle. But what do we do with this bottom shape? Well, actually what we can do is if we cut the shape in half down the middle, we can take each of these pieces and move it up to complete the semicircle. So then each, uh, the semicircle just becomes a rectangle, like so. So as you can see, each of these shapes formed by the dotted line and uh, the circle, this unshaded region, is the same as the sh uh, one half of the shaded region below. So we can divide up our weird shape and move it to complete the semicircle, and this forms a rectangle with a base of two and a height of one. So this means the area is two times one, which is two. Okay, so next we'll move on to an intersection problem, which is again another form of area, but it also involves splitting up a shape into smaller parts. So over here, we're given two circles which intersect with their central angles of the arcs at 60 degrees. So that means that if we drew these lines, both of these angles would be 60 degrees. So at first, this may seem confusing as there's not much information given about this intersection area, and it's not a circular shape in and of itself. But as you remember from the previous problem, if we break things up into subshapes and subtract occasionally, we can get, uh, simplify this problem a lot. Let's draw a couple of lines to see if we can split things up and notice something. So one of the most uh, visible lines would be from here to here, as this thing seems to form two triangles and also make this overall diagram a lot easier to understand. This is a common tactic in finding out weird areas, and it works well for this problem. Since we notice that this is now just two sectors overlapping, and each half of the intersection, such as this section, can be found by splitting up the sector into a triangle and that section. So more specifically, if this is a sector, this area of this small portion is equal to the total sector minus the triangle. And we know to find both the area of the sector and the triangle. As the sector has an area of one sixth of the total circle, since it has a 60 degree angle, it would be pi times r squared divided by six. Similarly, the triangle is an equilateral triangle with a uh, side length of r. So if you've uh, dealt with equilateral triangles before, you'll know that the formula for an area of the, such a triangle is uh, r squared times square root of three divided by four. So if we simply subtract them, we get that the area of the half is just r squared times pi over six minus square root of three over four. But if we remember carefully, the problem asks us to find the area of the total intersection. So we have to multiply this by two to get our final answer is r squared times pi over three minus square root of three over two. The next part of the problem is asking for something similar to find the area of the union, which simply means this total area. And again, we can do this problem practically the same way. If we split up the circle again, we notice that we have two sectors, which cover five sixths of the circle, and then in the center, there's just two triangles. So two five sixths of the circles simply make up five sixths times pi r squared times two, because there are two of them, and the two triangles in the center make up two times r squared square root three over two. So putting this together, we get their area is just five pi r squared over three plus square root three over two or r squared square root three over two, which would be the area of the union. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next main properties of circles, which occur when we add lines uh, around a circle. So we'll, we'll just briefly cover this and more details around the handouts for the proofs and the derivations for most of these. So, um, we, so first of all, for the lines, there are three main types of lines. Chords, which are connect two different points in the circle. Uh, secant lines, which are full lines that intersect the circle in two points. 
and tangent lines. Some of you might remember them from the problem last week. A tangent line is just a line that touches the circle at exactly one point. The main property of all three of these lines, if we draw a line from the center to, for a chord, the center of the chord, or for a tangent to the point of tangency, it forms a right angle. And this thing turns out to be very convenient as it often helps us use the Pythagorean theorem or just chase angles to solve problems. Uh, next, there are also a lot of properties of angles. So the main angle to use in circles, which we mentioned earlier, is the central angle. And the, um, the property of a central angle is if we draw any inscribed angle, which means that the vertex is on the circle, its length is always one half of the central angle. So as shown here, just because all three of these subtend the exact same arc, all three of them have the same measure. So I could have drawn any angle that subtends the same arc, even this, and this would also have a measure of x. Finally, there are also internal and external angles. And these also rely on central angles, but now there are two associated arcs, which are labeled x and y in this diagram. So we'll give you their values without proof right now, but the proofs are on the diagram, and we recommend checking them out in your own, the proofs are in the handout, and we recommend checking them out on your own afterwards if you haven't done so yet. But an interior angle will be one half times the sum of the two arcs, while the external angle will be one half times the difference. And now we'll move on to our final topic of uh, learning, which is called power of a flame. All right, so power of a point is a pretty broad topic. It's very important, especially with regards to competition math. Uh, it's covered in the AOPS textbook. If any of you guys have read that, it's a good read. So uh, at the math counts level, uh, most of the problems are on the more basic side, but as you progress through competition math, uh, problems become more intensive and uh, power of point is still extremely useful. So uh, this is something you should definitely uh, learn and remember. So the main concept of a power of a point is that if you have two chords intersecting in a circle, then uh, if the first segment is divided into a segment A here and a segment B on the other side of the intersection, while the second segment is, inter uh, is divided into C and D, then we get the property that uh, C times D equals A times B. And this is always true for any chords in the circle, whether or not they're the diameter or just like any chord. So this is the case for when the point is inside the circle. But when the point is outside the circle, uh, we get that if you draw any line from that point, the two points of intersection in the circle, so in this case, we would have M and N, we get that PM times PN equals PA times PB. Since any line from the point that intersects the circle twice, you take uh, the two segments formed by the point and the two intersections, and they are always equal. So what would happen if we took a tangent line? Because obviously there's only one point of intersection. Well, in this case, we would just treat the point of tangent as two intersections because as you get really close to the tangent, that's basically what it is. So this leads us to a formula that uh, we get that this is also equal to PT times PT, which is just PT squared. So this holds true for any point. So if you were to draw from a point, if you draw a line from a point and it intersects the circle at two points, any two points, let's say B, uh, C and D here, then uh, it would always be equal to any other intersection as long as the line passes through that point P. So here we already had PM equals PN, or PM times PN equals PA times PB, and all of this would also equal PC times PD. And this applies to any line that passes through point P. <clears throat> so uh, last week we did a problem. Uh, there was a problem on the homework that was uh, pretty messy uh, using coordinate geometry, but when you use a uh, power of point, it actually becomes much easier. So let's uh, recap the problem. So uh, the problem was that there exists a point B uh, on the circle with center O and a point P outside the circle such that PO is perpendicular to OB. PO has length equal to the diameter of the circle O and PB equals the circle at A. 
So it asks us to find PA over AB. So first, we uh, let's call the intersection of PO and the circle, uh, let's say, uh, C, right? So if we extend uh, PO to have it intersect the circle once more, let's call this other intersection D. Uh, do any of you guys see where we can use power of point? So, uh, as James said, uh, yeah, we can use it on PAPB as well as PCPD. So, what power point tells us is that from point P, we can take the power there and we get that PC times PD equals PA times PB. So that's the first piece of information we've got. So the problem also tells us that PO is equal to the diameter of circle O. So the diameter would be uh, CD since the chord CD passes through O the center, so it has to be a diameter. So that means we get that uh, OC is the radius. So that means CP equals also the radius since OP is 2R. And we also know that OD is the radius. So we get that the entire length of PD is 3R. And then the entire length of PC is just R. So this means that here we get this is 3R squared. And this equals PA times PB. So since we know that, uh, so we also know that uh, triangle POB is a right triangle. And we know that OB is the radius. So that means if we use Pythagoras theorem, we have 2R squared plus R squared is the hypotenuse squared. So we get that the hypotenuse is the square root of 5R squared. And this is just root 5R. So no, we know that uh, PB is root 5R now. So PA has to equal 3R squared over PB, which is five, root 5R. So this uh, becomes uh, 3 over root 5R, which if we simplify is 3 root 5 over 5R. So that means AB equals PB minus PA, which is uh, root 5R minus 3 fifths times root 5R. So this just becomes 2 fifths root 5R. So now uh, if we take AB over uh, PA, we get that, or PA over AB, we get that uh, this is 3 fifths root 5R over 2 fifths root 5R. So since the root 5R cancels out in the top and the bottom, we get that the ratio is 3 fifths over 2 fifths, which is just 3 halves. And this required much less work than if you did this last week requiring coordinate geometry, because when you use a coordinate system in this, it became very messy. So this is just like another method to solve problems. And I guess as you do more problems, you get to know like when to use what. and when things are better used and more efficient. So uh, now uh, we'll move on to some problems. Uh, these problems will be ranging from a more easy difficulty to some rather hard questions. Okay, so also we'll move on to problems categorized more by type than difficulty. So our first type of problem is dealing with radii. So this problem has a right triangle with side lengths of 8, 15, and 17, and a circle is circumscribed around the triangle, and we want to find the radius of the circle in centimeters. So 8, 15, 17 is a Pythagorean triple since we're, we know it forms a right triangle, and this is in general something good to memorize, like common Pythagorean triples such as like 3, 4, 5 triangles, 5, 12, 13, and so on. But this problem anyways tells it's a right triangle, so we don't have to worry about that. And from earlier, we know that this angle, which is 90 degrees, subtends this whole, this semicircle. 
And as we know that this uh, angle, central angle for a semicircle is a full 180 degrees. That means, or sorry, we know that this thing subtends this whole arc, which means that its central angle would be two times 90 equals 180 degrees, which means that this is simply the diameter. So as we know that the side length has length 17, the radius is just half of that, which would be 8.5 centimeters. Okay, on to our next problem. So this one has a square of area 40 inscribed in a semicircle. And inscribed basically means that all the edges and vertices of the shape are touching the uh, boundaries of the um, circumscribed shape. So we wanna find the area of the semicircle given that we know the area of the square. So a common tactic for most radius problems involves drawing in radii. So if we know the centers over here, the radii that make the most sense to draw in are to the two corners of the square. And we can call them R. Now we also know the area of the square is 40, which means the side length of the square equals square root of 40. So that means this is root 40. But in the same manner, as the square is exactly circumscribed within the semicircle, it must be, its midpoint must be at the midpoint of the semicircle as well, which means that this length is equal to S over two, or other words, root 40 over two. This means we can just use the Pythagorean theorem to find the radius, as we'll get r squared equals 40 plus 40 over four, so it equals 50. Now, we wanna find the area of the semicircle, not a full circle, so you have to make sure not to make the mistake of just writing pi r squared as our answer. So the area of a semicircle is pi r squared divided by two, which would turn to 50 pi over two equals 25 pi. Okay, our next question is a bit harder as it's not very clear immediately what the, how to approach it. So we have a, a large square with a circle inscribed in it and then another rectangle inside of that square. And we're given some of the lengths of the rectangle and we wanna find the radius of the circle. So similar to the last problem, even though this is a bit more complicated, we'll start by drawing in some radii that will make things easier. So from the center, the, we know that at points of tangency, it forms a 90 degree angle. And 90 degree angles are very convenient normally since it allows us to use a Pythagorean theorem. So let's start by drawing in some of those. Even so, we have right angles right now, but we don't have any particular triangles. So we have to draw in a couple more right eye to see what we'll get. We can draw it particularly to the rectangle. Doing so, we still don't have triangles, but now we can notice that if we drop a perpendicular from this point to each of these legs, we form right triangles. Specifically, if we draw this line and this line. Now we have a couple right triangles. But the only lengths we have are the length are the lengths of the side of the rectangle. So we have to somehow relate those lengths to the radius. So if we write them in here, we notice that if this length is five, this length is also five, uh, since there this forms a rectangle. And similarly, if this length is ten, this length will also be ten. That means that this is r minus ten, and this is r minus five, as both of these have length r as the radii and the line connecting the center of the circle to the corner of the square also has length of r. And now we have something that we can work with since we have a right triangle in which we know all the sides in terms of r. That means all that's left is just a bit about Pythagorean theorem and algebra. So we get that r minus five squared plus r minus 10 squared, which are the two legs of this triangle equals r squared. Expanding gives us r squared minus 10 r plus 25 plus r squared minus 20 r plus 100 equals r squared, which simplifies to r squared minus 30 r plus 125 equals zero. Over here, we could either use the quadratic theorem. Yeah, as James said, the answer is 25. But at this point, we could either use the quadratic theorem or we could just notice how to factor this. Uh, if you haven't covered factoring before in school, it's fine. Uh, we'll cover that in a future lecture. But the main thing is this thing turns out to factor into r minus 25 times r minus five. And if you didn't know how to factor, you could just use the quadratic theorem equals zero. So Desai commented that five is an answer. 
And while five is of answer algebraically, it doesn't actually make sense as an answer, as that would mean that we have some negative lens, as r minus 10 would be negative. Yeah, so as Theo said, only one of these is actually a solution, r equals 25. So when dealing with quadratics, a lot of time you'll get two solutions when only one of them is an actual answer. So this r equal minus five uh, equals zero would be an extraneous solution, which simply means it doesn't make sense physically for this problem, as the circle's uh, radius simply cannot be five, given that this rectangle has side lengths of five and 10. So our final answer is just 25. All right, so now we'll move on to another radius question, this time in a slightly more complicated diagram. This one has a silo-shaped figure, which is formed by positioning a semicircle above a square. And the diameter of the semicircle is two, meaning that its radius is one, and it coincides with the top of the square. So what is the radius of the small circle that contains this figure? So over here in the diagram, we've already drawn in this larger circle, and we want to find this length of r. So we'll start by where the center of the circle is. By symmetry, we know it has to be along the center of the square, as it's equidistant from this point and this point. And as we covered in a previous lesson, the any point that's equidistant from two points must lie along the perpendicular bisector of those two lines, which means that the radius is somewhere along this line. So next we can, if we call the radius r, we notice that this length is r, but the length from here to here is also r. Combining this with the fact that the uh, radius of the semicircle is one, we know that if from here to here is r, and from here to here is one, that means this segment is equal to r minus one. Now this is very convenient since we also know the side length of the square. As the radius of the, as the diameter of the semicircle is two, that means the side length of the square is also two, which means all these sides have length two. So this side length is simply two minus r minus one equals three minus r. And finally, we notice that we have a right triangle over here with this side as uh, three minus r as one of the legs, this side, which is equal to the radius of the semicircle as one, and the hypotenuse is r. So once again, we're just down to using the Pythagorean theorem and a bit of algebra to solve for our final answer. So we get one squared plus three minus r squared equals r squared, which simplifies to one plus nine minus six r plus r squared equals r squared. So canceling out the r squared, we get that 6r equals 10, and r equals 5 thirds as our final answer. So as another point, this circle is called the circumcircle of the shape, and there are a lot of common uh, theorems about them, but for the middle school level, most of the problems involving them just come down to drawing in uh, radi radii and making some clever observations, such as finding the length of this um, segment for this problem. Next, we'll go into one last problem about radii. So we have two circles with radii 16 and nine, which are tangent to each other, and are also tangent to a line at distinct points P and Q. And we wanna find the length of this segment PQ. So this problem is a bit different from the ones before where we're given the radii instead of trying to find them. So let's start off by listing what we know. We have two circles with the, the radii and a common tangent. Since the tangent, we can draw the radii to the tangents and we'll have a right angle. And now we'll see that if we call the two centers of the circle A and B, AB, PQ, is a right trapezoid because both these angles are right angles. So now we can just try to find the length of this. If we drop a perpendicular from A to, Q, to BQ, meaning we draw the tangent line, or sorry, a perpendicular line, we find that we have a right triangle here, which has a hypotenuse of length 9 plus 16, which combines to form 25, and this length, the leg length, as this whole thing is 16 and this segment will be nine, that means the other leg has a length of seven. So now to find the length from A to this uh, drop perpendicular, we can again use the Pythagorean theorem, as we have a triangle with legs 25 and seven. So using the Pythagorean theorem, we get 25 squared minus seven squared equals 625 minus 49 equals square root of 576, which as James said is 24. So that means this length is 24. But again, as we know that this thing is a rectangle, PQ, this uh, drop perpendicular, and A, 
form a rectangle, that means that PQ also has length of 24. And yeah, as Jay mentioned, 7, 24, 25 is another one of the common Pythagorean triplets. So as you work through a lot of competition math problems, Pythagorean theorem will show up again and again, so it'll pay off to memorize some of the smaller values of Pythagorean triples that work out. All right, so now we've done quite a few radius problems, so we'll move on to a different type of problem, specifically areas. So we have a quarter circle AOB, which has a radius of OA and OB, both of which have length one, and a semicircle is drawn with diameter AB away from O. Find the area of the semicircle, but out, that's outside of AOB. So first let's start by labeling our points in this diagram. So we're given that the quarter circle AOB, so it's most likely focusing on this quarter circle, has radii of OA and OB. And the semicircle, which is drawn with diameter AB, is away from O. And we simply want to find the area of this segment. So as we've seen in previous problems, we want to try breaking this down into smaller things. So let's focus on three main parts of this question. Let's call them A, B, and C. So A is the easiest one to deal with, as it's just a triangle. And we can easily find the area of a triangle. So let's look at B now. B, we've seen this in one of the earlier example problems. It's a sector minus a triangle. So more specifically, B would equal a sector minus a triangle. And then finally, if we look at section C, section C is an entire semicircle, but minus section B. So again, if we write this out in words, it would be C equals semicircle minus B, which is a semicircle minus a sector plus a triangle. So each of, now we've managed to find the expression for C in terms of shapes that we can easily find the areas of. And that's basically one of the fundamental properties for any competition math problem involving areas. So now we can just solve for the, each of these areas. The area of the semicircle is, can be solved by 1 half pi r squared, but we don't know what the uh, radius is immediately. As we know that OA has length 1 and OB has length 1, by the Pythagorean theorem, AB has length 1 squared plus 1 squared equals square root of 2. This means that AB, or sorry, yeah. This means that A to the center of this uh, AB has length of half of that, which would be root 2 over 2, which means that the radius for the semicircle is root 2 over 2. So its total area is pi times root 2 over 2 squared divided by 2, which is just pi over 4. Similarly for the sector, we know that the area is 1 and we have a quarter circle. So all we have to do is just take pi divided by 4, and that's our answer for the sector. Finally, our triangle has lengths 1 and 1, and as it's a right triangle, we can just multiply the base times the height and divide by 2. And this gives us 1 half as our final answer. Now this is a rather surprising result as it a curved area, yet the area is, turns out to be a nice fraction. And this specific shape is called the Luna of Hippocrates. The name doesn't particularly matter, but it's cool to know that some people came up with this a long time ago. All right, so here we have our next question. So the question is that uh, we have a radius, a uh, circle of radius two, and it's centered at uh, O here. And we also have a square OABC, which has a side length one. So sides AB and CB are extended past B to meet the circle at D and E, which are shown here. Uh, and it asks us to find the shaded region, which are bounded by BD, BE, and the uh, minor arc of the circle. So the shaded region we see below. So, uh, well, uh, as we read the problem, uh, one of the first things we note is that since square OABC has side length one, that means C and A are both uh, midpoints of the radii that they're on. 
So uh, what we can do here is, so the shaded region is quite a weird shape, right? So like uh, other problems involving these areas before, we want to uh, find shapes that we know how to find and then kind of manipulate it in a way such that we can add or subtract other areas to find it. So here uh, we see that we want to find the area that's between D and E that contains the minor arc. So generally when we see that we want to find part of the circle including the arc, we can draw OD and OE and have that entire sector. Since the sector also includes the curved part of the shape, uh, this allows us to get rid of like the weird things with the curves and only have to deal with uh, straight lines, which are much easier to deal with. So here we can see that the area D uh, of the shaded region is just the sector minus the unshaded part, which is uh, quadrilateral ODBE. So uh, this is a bit better since we don't have to deal with a really weird curved shape, but uh, it's still kind of weird of a shape trying to find ODBE. So what we can do now again is we can draw OB. And we see that it forms two triangles, each with a base BE and a height of CO and one with a base DB and a height of AO. So uh, now all we have to do is just find these values. So we already know that OA and OC are one. So uh, we want to find uh, BE. And we know that BE can be written as CE, which is the entire segment, minus one, which is equal to CB. So now we want to find CE, because if we know CE, we can find BE. So since we know what OC is, it's one, and we also know what OE is, since that's a radius, it's two. And we can also see that OCE is a right triangle again. And this tends to come up a lot uh, when we're trying to find these areas. We wanna find nice right angles that we can use the Pythagorean theorem on, because it just allows us to easily find values. So we, no we notice that uh, OC is one and CE is two. So using, uh, sorry, OE is two. Uh, we notice that uh, we use Pythagorean's theorem, we get that CE equals two squared, a uh, square root of two squared minus one squared, which is the square root of three. And for some of you, you might recognize this type of triangle. It's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So what that means is that CEO is 30 degrees and COE is 60 degrees. And this is a pretty famous triangle since one of the legs, uh, the hypotenuse is exactly double one of the legs. So we found out that CE is root three. So that means that uh, BE is root three minus one. So that means the area of OBE is root three minus one times one divided by two. So it's root three minus one over two. And we can do the same thing with the ODB. But we can also see that uh, it's basically, it's exactly congruent to uh, OEB, since it's just like a reflection about OB. So we, instead of trying to find ODB, we can just say that it's equal to OEB, which is equal to root three minus one over two. So when we add together these two values, uh, it just becomes root three minus one. So, now all that's left is we want to find the area of the sector of DE. So we know, uh, so like I said earlier, uh, OCE is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So uh, if CEO is 30 degrees, since uh, CE is parallel to OA, we get that EOA is also 30 degrees. And uh, in general, this is a very useful thing to know. Uh, 30, 60, 90 triangles, as well as 45, 45, 90 triangles. Uh, these are also used a lot in competition math. And it's just good to be like fast with them and just like know them off of like the back of your hand. So we know that EOA is 30 degrees. So then uh, we can do the same with DOC and that's also 30 degrees. And since we know that uh, OABC is a square, that means COA is 90 degrees. 
So that means we can find the angle DOE. So it's 90 minus 30 minus 30. So we get that uh, DOE is also 30 degrees. So to find the area of the sector, we just do 30 degrees over uh, the entire circle, which is 360 degrees times the area, which is 2 pi r. And in this case, r is 2. So it's 2 pi uh, four, uh, 2 squared, which is 4. So 30 over 360 is 12, or is 1 over 12. So this becomes pi times 4 over 12, which is pi over 3. So the shaded region we said earlier is the area of the entire sector minus the area of O, D, B, E. So we know that ODBE has an area of root 3 minus 1, and the sector has an area of pi over 3. So this becomes pi over 3 minus the quantity root 3 minus 1. So this becomes pi over 3 minus root 3 plus 1. And that is our answer. All right. So uh, our next few questions will be uh, involving primarily angles as opposed to earlier questions. So generally, uh, these different types of questions have different approaches. And it just, as you do more of these problems, you'll understand when to use, use what kind of approach. So here, uh, the question asks us, uh, or tells us that lines L1 and L2 are parallel. Uh, circle O is tangent to L1, which is the bottom line in this case, at point A. And L2 intersects the circle at B and C. So if angles ABC, or if angle ABC is 34 degrees, what is the angle BAC? So <clears throat> we can see that uh, ABC is 34 degrees, right? So uh, since lines L1 and L2 are parallel, uh, since CAB, or CBA is 34 degrees, that means the smaller angle formed by line segment BA and line one is also 34 degrees. All right, but uh, if you guys remember what we talked about with angles, uh, the angle 30, uh, the 34, the angle that measures 34 that we just drew, it's it's subtends arc BA. And since the line, uh, one of the lines that form the angle is tangent, that means uh, the arc AB is also 34 degrees. So, uh, so that means if arc AB is 34 degrees, that means uh, angle BCA, which also subtends the same arc AB, is 34. So that means BCA is 34. So like Theo said, we now have a triangle. Uh, it's isosceles triangle. And what we can do to find BAC is since the angles of a triangle always sum to 180, we can take 180 minus 34 minus 34, which is uh, 180 minus 68, which is 112. So uh, that's our final answer. And uh, yeah, so moving on to our next question. So this is another question that involves angles. Uh, so A, B, and C lie on a circle. A uh, line L is tangent to the circle at B. So we have our line, our bottom line there. And uh, the line that passes through A, C intersects uh, the line L at D, which is all the way out here. So if angles A, B, C are 50, 60, and 70 respectively, it asks us to find angle D. So what we can do here is, so like before, we want to find angle D. So uh, something that helps us find angles is just like, if you know two angles of a triangle, you can find the third. So if we draw triangle uh, B, C, D here, we can see that you can see that uh, we get that uh, it's 180 minus the angle DCB minus DBC. So angle DBC, angle DBC is equal to, uh, it subtends arc BC. So that means it's equal to a uh, angle BAC since uh, they both 
subtend the same arc. And that just means that they cover the same part of the arc. So you can see they both uh, subtend this minor arc BC. So since we know that angle A or angle BAC as we've drawn here is 50 degrees, that means that angle DBC is 50 degrees. So that's uh, the first angle of a triangle. So now we have to find angle DCB. But since, uh, since uh, ACD is a line, that means angle DCB is supplementary to angle ACB. So that just means they sum to 180. So that means to find this angle, we just take 180 minus angle ACB. And this problem tells us that uh, angle C is 70 degrees. So that means it's 180 minus 70, which gives us 110. So uh, using this, we know that uh, angle, those, the two angles we found sum to 160. So that means the angle D is equal to 180 minus the sum of those angles. So it's 180 minus 110 minus 50, which is 20, like Fiona and Ditya said, yeah. So that's our final answer, 20. So our next question is points A, B, C, D, and E are lie on a circle. So now we have five points. So it tells us that CD equals DE is greater than AB. So lines BE and AD intersect at P and lines BD and AC intersect at Q. Find the difference between angles APB and AQB. So well, let's uh, unpack the information from this problem first. So uh, the first thing we see is that it tells us that uh, C is CD equals DE is greater than AB. So this means that since uh, CD is greater than AB and so is DE, that means angle APB equals uh, the arc DE minus the arc AB. Uh, this is something that we covered earlier in our introduction. And since uh, we know it's the difference between the arcs and we know that one of the arcs is smaller, that means it's the larger arc minus the smaller arc. And then we have to divide by two. So uh, the same can be done with AQB and that is equal to C, uh, D minus A, B over Q. So, now what else does the problem tell us? So the problem tells us that, uh, yeah, so as James says, the problem tells us that C, D equals D, E as well. And we haven't really used that. So since CD equals DE, uh, all of, uh, we can, we're not gonna prove this, but whenever these are equal, that means the arcs that they cover, so arc CD and arc DE are also equal. And this should be pretty intuitive, though the proof is a bit long, since they're similar or congruent. So that means the two arcs are equal. So if we plug this in, since DE and CD are equal, that means we get the expressions for APB and AQB are both equal to CD minus AB over Q. So that means they're equal. So that means the difference between the two angles is zero since they're both equal to each other. So yeah, that's our final answer. All right, so this is a more difficult question. So, Points A, B, and C are on the circle of center O. B, O intersects the circle again at point D. Find the angle A, O, D if angle B, A, C is 20 and A, C, O is four. So uh, we'll start out by labeling all our angles. And this is useful for whenever you're trying to, uh, this is called angle chasing where we're given a few angles and we want to find a final angle. And we're just using properties of triangles and circles, et cetera. So we'll begin by labeling. So BAC is 20, so this is 20. And ACO, which is the small angle, it is four. So we've labeled our angles, right? So let's see what we can do right now. So we don't really know too much, right? But we can see that uh, since uh, all the three points are on a circle, we can probably do something with the circle. So since 
O is the center, that means that angle BOC is exactly twice angle BAC. Uh, this is one of the properties we went over earlier. Uh, it's really good to review these uh, and just to know them by heart because they can come up quite a lot. So that means that this angle is 40 degrees. Now, we're a little bit stuck here. We don't, we don't really know what else we can do, right? Well, another special thing we can realize is that any triangle formed by two points and the center of a circle, where the two points are on the circle, since two of the sides have to be the radius, like in this case, OB and OC are the radius, well then, since two of the sides are equal, it has to be isosceles. And since uh, OB equals OC, that means the angles OBC and OCB are equal. And since they're part of an isosceles triangle, we know that these two angles plus 40 is 180. So if we call each of these angles X, we get that X plus X plus 40, which is 2X plus 40, equals 180. So that means 2X equals 140, so X equals 70 degrees. So once again, we're using the property that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. Although this doesn't really relate to circles, it's very useful. Uh, now, we can see that we've used the triangle OBC, but we haven't used the triangle ABC much yet. So we can tell that angle A is 20 degrees. And since we know ACO and a, uh, OCB, uh, that means angle o, uh, a, 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 C, B is the sum of those two angles, which is 70 plus 4. So that means that the two angles are uh, 20 and 74. And that means the final angle, which is A, B, C, is 180 minus 20 minus 74, which is 86. And since we know that uh, O, B, C is 70 degrees, that means O, B, O, or A, B, O is 16, which is 86 minus 70. So that's 16 degrees, right? And since one, once again, it tells us that D is on the circle and it passes through, and BD passes through O, that means that, uh, that means that the angle, the arc AD has a measure of 16 degrees since the angle ABD is 16 degrees. So that means angle AOD is twice that angle, so it's 32 degrees. And that gives us our final answer of 32 degrees. So you can see that most of these uh, angle-related problems involve like using various properties from uh, the fact that the angle at the radius uh, at the center of the circle is twice the angle along the circle, or that the angles of a triangle sum to 180. So uh, the more of these properties you know, and like as you do more problems, you'll get used to know when to use which properties, those get faster at this. And these problems come up quite often. Uh, they persist through uh, harder competitions as well. And they're just labeled under uh, the umbrella of angle chasing. So now we've been moving on to uh, problems relating to power of a point. So we'll start out with an easier question. Um, this question tells us that AR over BR equals one over four, and CR over DR equals four over nine. So it asks us to find the ratio AB over CD. So we know that a, uh, we're given uh, some properties first, but we can also tell since they're cores in a circle and they intersect at R, if we apply power of point, we know that AR times RB equals CR times RD. And we know these have to be equal. So if we let AB equals 5X, units, and we let CD be 13 Y units, and we choose these numbers because it allows us to split it up into the ratios that are given, one to four sums to five, and four to nine sums to 13. We get that AR is X, BR is four X, CR is four Y, and DR is nine Y. So plugging this into our power of a point, we get that 4x squared equals 36y squared. All right, and uh, solving, we get that x 
equals 9y or 3y since x squared equals 9y squared. So we've already let a, b, b, 5x, and c, d, b, 13y. So uh, the ratio a, b over c, d equals 5x over 13y. And we can plug in 3y for x, and we get that this is 15y over 13y, which is 15 over 13. So uh, I guess the most important part of this question was to let uh, the segments be a variable va value, so 5x and 13y, that made the problem much easier and allowed us to solve. So our next question here, we have a circle center O and diameter AB, uh, chord CD intersects AB at E such that uh, OE is five. So it tells us that if CE is six and DE is four, what is the radius of the circle? So we can kind of tell that we need to use power of point here, right? We have intersecting chords, but we're not really sure on what the lengths are. So we know the two lengths of two of the segments on CE and ED, but we don't know AE or EB. However, we do know that we do know that it passes through the center of the circle, and we know that OE is five. So this kind of tells us that we have to use the radius or the diameter in some way. So what we can do instead is we can let the radius be r, and we see that AE is equal to r plus five, and EB is equal to uh, the diameter minus AE, which is two r minus r plus five, which is r minus uh, r minus five. So that means if we plug in power point, so we multiply r uh, AE and EB, which is equal to r plus five, r minus five. Uh, for those of you who know, this is a difference of squares. If you just multiply this out, this becomes r squared minus 25. And this is equal to six times four from power point. So that means solving for r squared, we get r squared equals 24 plus 25, which is 49. So that means r has to equal seven or negative seven, but obviously negative seven doesn't work because we can't have a negative radius. And like we've mentioned earlier, this is what we call an extraneous solution because when you plug this in, you get non like nonsense, like you get negative radius or some other weird thing. So this gives us a final answer that the radius is seven. All right, uh, we're almost out of time here, but I think we can do our last question. So this is a bit more difficult. So uh, two tangents from an external point P are drawn to the circle and intersected at uh, A and B. So A and B are the tangent points. A line L is tangent to the circle at point T such that uh, it intersects uh, P A and P B at Q and R respectively. Find the perimeter of P, Q, and R. So, um, I'd like to ask you guys, where do you guys think we can use power of a point here? All right, so like as James said, we can use power of point on PA and PB. So this gives us that PA squared equals PB squared. But we, what we can also do is you can notice that we also have a uh, power point from point R. So we get that RB squared equals RT squared and QT squared equals QA squared. So using this, we get that uh, PA equals PB, RB equals RT and QT equals QA. So the perimeter of the triangle is equal to PR plus QR plus PQ. So we can write PR as PB minus BR. And we can also write QR as RT plus QT. And we can write PQ as PA minus AQ. So we've already established that uh, QA or AQ is equal to QT and that 
uh, RB or BR is equal to RT. So you can see that these should cancel out. And this leaves us with PA plus PB. And since we've already established that PA equals PB from power of point, that means we get this is equal to 2PA. And since we know that PA is 5, this is equal to 10. That's the other side, yes. So uh, this, point, this question, I guess, highlights that uh, you don't necessarily only use power of point once. You can use it multiple times. And like some of them are harder to notice than others. And that you should always look out to when you can use this, use this, but also just don't try to force it. Because if you try to forcibly do a problem the wrong way, you'll end up just wasting your own time. 